My father died of tuberculosis. So did my older brother. And my mother was in a sanatorium for about two and a half years. I was the most delicate baby in the family. And I was what they called predisposed. You have no idea how many gallons of cod liver oil. That's what they gave in those days. Cod liver oil. I hate the stuff. <laughs> But uh, it's interesting, when I started out on a bicycle at the age of 21, plenty of fresh air, cycled 60 miles a day perhaps, only eating the plainest of food, it must have done something to my constitution. Well, I was converted on my ninth birthday. Mother led me to Christ. But I didn't have a dramatic conversion. <laughs> and I was a teenager when I was baptized. It meant a lot to me. I wanted to do something for the Lord, so I started to go to Christian Endeavor meetings first. One day I went to a friend of mine, Jim Wilkinson was his name. I said, Jim, can you preach? He said, no, can you? Well, I said, I've read a paper in the Christian Endeavor. He said, I've read a paper too, but who would ask us to preach? Oh, I said, we can take care of that. Let's start in the open air. I'll invite you, then you can invite me. He said, how are you to get a crowd? I said, we'll get a crowd, all right. Did you know that my career began uh, as a musician? I played a ukulele. Just a tiny little ukulele. But my friend Wilkinson couldn't sing in tune. He would always sing an octave lower in H flat. <laughs> we never struck the same note together, but we always gathered a crowd. So we started in the open air in the notorious Shankill district of Belfast, where a lot of the fighting has been going on since. And we formed a little band of prayer pray for spiritual revival. I had found that my grandfather and grandmother were both converted the same year. It was the year 1859 when 100,000 people in the north of Ireland were converted in that remarkable movement. So I was always very curious. My early interest in revival was sentimental. Now I trust it's more objective, but at the same time just as real. In fact, more so. You say, if you've never preached before, how could you preach? I'll give this as a word of advice to any aspiring young preacher. Never try to preach beyond your experience. My mother led me to Christ. The verse she used was, he was wounded for our transgressions from Isaiah. So I preached on that. It meant something to me. Then we had another musical number with the ukulele and uh, the basso profundo. And... Uh, some moved on and others joined the crowd. Then Jim took his turn to preach. We got such a blessing out of it. We decided to form a band of 24 young men do this kind of work once a week. We decided not to let any girls join our group. We didn't want to be driven to distraction. So we started that way. Well, I remember, I was still a teenager, when one of the fellows asked, we always had prayer before we started out, and we were having prayer in my home, and one of the fellows said, does God really answer prayer, or is it just coincidence? I said, well, why don't we try and find out? He said, how would you find out? I said, let's keep a record. So I got a notebook, and I opened it and ruled down a line on one side of the page. We wrote the date and the thing for which we prayed. We left a space for the answer and the date on the other page. This was a real practical test. I still remember the first request. I said, fellas, there are 24 of us now and my ukulele is no good. I just strike a chord and nobody hears it after that. It's so quiet. Let's pray for a banjo mandolin or a piano accordion or something like that. So we wrote that down. Three days later, I had a phone call 
fellow said, uh, this is Bert Bradley. I said, do I know you? He said, I've just come to the city from the country. He said, I'm a bank clerk. I'm a friend of Sidney Murray. He said, he told me you're having open air meetings. Could I help? Well, I said, can you do anything? There's no good taking along extra baggage, you know. Well, he said, I'll tell you the truth. He said, I'm not much good at public speaking. He said, I can't even give my testimony without getting mixed up. But he said, I'll play a banjo mandolin. If that'll help you, I'll help you in your music. There was our answer to prayer. We kept a record like that for a year. And I discovered that God had answered, not always yes, mind you. I remember once we prayed that it wouldn't rain. It came down in sheets of rain. But we were forced to take shelter in a little Presbyterian church where they had a struggling midweek service. And for at least 20 young fellows to come in and help take over, that pastor was really encouraged. So we were glad it rained that night. It was all in the Lord's purpose. Now this was during the Depression, when people were very discouraged. And at that time, my mother, a widow, my brother, ill, before he died, and my sister out of work, I had to give up and start in working to support the family. I was only supposed to go home. Now, in this little prayer band, I still remember the little sentimental things. For instance, when we met as a committee, we always left the chairman's seat vacant to remind us the Lord Jesus Christ was in the chair. And um, if ever we cross purposes or had any disagreement we'd say well let's ask the chairman now and we'd have a word of prayer one night coming home with Charles Coulter he was a salvationist I said Charlie is there anything deeper for a Christian oh yes so I asked him about it I said do you know anyone who's had a deeper experience well he said yes I said who? He said, William Booth I said, General Booth is dead. Could you please mention somebody that's alive that I can study? <laughs> well, as a result of that, Charlie and I went to see a young pastor. He belonged to George Jeffrey's movement, Elam, Pentecostal movement. Now, I was a convinced Baptist and my friend was a salvationist, but we went to see this pastor. God bless him. He was having a campaign in the country somewhere, but he came up on his Monday off to talk to two boys. We talked from 8 until 10. And I just told him frankly, I don't know what to believe. The Baptists teach this, and the Methodists teach that, the Presbyterians teach this, and the Episcopalians teach that, and the Salvation Army teaches this, and the Pentecostals teach that. I don't know what to believe. He said, let me ask you a question. Do you concede you have a need? And I said, oh yes. Do you think God can meet that need? I said, yes, I'm sure. He said, you think he's made provision for that need? So he talked to me. And at 10 o'clock he had me convinced. Just at that moment, the last thing, by the way, he said to me was, you seem to think, Edwin, that your besetting sins are the main hindrance. They're not. He said, the blood of Jesus Christ can cleanse you from all sin. The problem is your will. Clock struck ten, the senior pastor thought, now nah, those two boys have been talking too long to our friend, and he needs his rest before he goes back to the campaign. So he came up to get rid of us. You know how a pastor gets rid of you? He says, let's have a word of prayer. <laughs> <laughs> and the four of us got on our knees, and we were on our knees till two in the morning. The Lord started to speak to me. And the very first question was, what about your besetting sins? And I said, Lord, I hate them. I said, well, that's no problem. Lord, you know how to deal with them. I'll put them right. But then the question was, what about your will? And he touched me in a very sensitive point. I was going steady then with an Irish girl who had started me attending Christian Endeavor meetings. Many a fellow started going to the meetings because of a girl. But when the Lord said to me, are you willing to give this friendship up if I should ask you? I began to argue. I said, she's been a blessing to me. I mean, I was telling the Lord 
this business. <laughs> Finally, I got to a place where I said, Lord, I don't understand this. Not my will, but your will be done. However, I said, if you want me to give this girl up, let her give me up and I won't try and get her back. And for the first time in my life, I felt there wasn't a cloud between me and the Lord. It wouldn't be, in fact, very rarely do I ever mention that there were even, I would call it, maybe the word physical isn't the word to use, manifestation, but just as if God poured into my soul, burning cold. Never had experience like it in my life. Walked home at two o'clock in the morning. I felt like jumping over the river instead of going over the bridge. Got home at three, knelt by the rocking chair. Like Finney, Finney put a handkerchief to his mouth because he was praying so loud. Mother was a very light sleeper and I didn't want to disturb her, so, but I couldn't but pray. And sure enough, seven in the morning before I went to work, she said, you came in late last night. Now, I've been in the habit of equivocating by 55 minutes. If I came in at 5 to 12, I'd say it was after 11. Well, 5 to 12 is after 11. <laughs> so I was going to say it was after midnight, because 3 o'clock is after midnight. <laughs> but I couldn't deceive her, so I said I came in at 3. She said, where were you till 3 in the morning? By the way, when I was growing up, kids didn't stay at half the night the way they do nowadays. We were in by 11, always. Girls were in earlier than that often. But she said, where were you to 3 o'clock? When I said, Charlie and Coulter and I went to a meeting. She said, where did that meeting until 3 in the morning? When I said, it wasn't a regular meeting. I said, just a pastor and two pastors and two of us. She said, what's all about? Oh, I, it's hard to talk to your own about things like that. Finally, I said, well, Charlie and I wanted to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I thought I'd get a maternal lecture. Well, now, I'm glad to hear this, but you know, since your father died, you haven't always done, you know, thus and so. But instead of that, tears ran down her cheeks. She said, when your Aunt Nellie came back from Canada, she had come into a new experience. I didn't understand all that she said, but I wanted whatever Nellie had. She said, of course, I already had two children, and Nellie wasn't married. But she said, I left them with your dad, and I went to a meeting in Botanic Gardens run by the Faith Mission. And uh, I went forward. She said, nothing happened. But she said, on the way home that night, I thought, well, Lord, I've done everything possible. When I got home, she said, both your brother and sister had high fevers. Your father was distraught. And then she said, with a little tinge of sorrow, the rest of my life I've been looking after a dying husband and sick children. But she said, I wondered if the Lord wouldn't claim the unborn fruit of the womb. So that was just two months before you were born. So, the first experience of revival was in my own heart. My Pentecostal friends were disappointed I didn't speak in tongues. But God gave me a measure of the gift of faith. The head of a big organization in London heard of what I was doing. Now, I'd been six years in business. I worked in the office of a large bakery concern. My heart was in the preaching ministry, but my stomach was in the bakery, of course. But uh, this man heard of what I was doing and offered me a salary to do this kind of work under the auspices of their organization all over the world. I was delighted. Just think of somebody paying me for what I wanted to do. He told me he'd give me enough money to support my mother. So I went straight back to my home city and told mother and told others that I was going to leave home to do this kind of work. They all congratulated me. One man said, God has opened a door for you. But the day after I gave up my job, my friend in London wrote me a letter to say he had to go to India and China and Japan 
right around the world for missionary conferences. He was going to be away for about a year. His committee wouldn't be responsible for me while he was away. So he told me to go back to work again. I could have gotten my job back. It was much easier to give me back my job than train somebody else for it. But the more I prayed about it, the more I felt God was calling me to this work. So I told my friends that I was going to start out by faith. They said, why would you dare do this? was during the Depression. Now you youngsters don't know what it was like during the Depression. People were starving. There was no social security, no unemployment insurance. There were soup kitchens and bread lines. This was during the Depression. They all told me I was crazy. I still remember one man who was the exception. I remember him with gratitude. His name was Sidney Murray. He said he didn't know whether I was crazy or not. But all the others thought I was. <laughs> Mother said, what's going to happen to us in the meantime? I said, Mother, I'll send you the usual amount of money each week. She said, I know you'll try, but where will you get it? Now, I wasn't an evangelist traveling around holding weeks of meetings. I'd never held a week of meetings in my life. I was just a youth speaker, you know, speaking at young people's meetings occasionally. So I started out, I gave money, all, all the money I possessed to my mother, and I started out. I arrived in Liverpool with two shillings and eight pence, which in those days was 65 cents. Now, of course, money went further in those days than now, but even so, 65 cents wouldn't take you very far. I had a bicycle, change of clothes, and a Bible. The only friend I had within 150 miles of Liverpool was a Roman Catholic scoutmaster whom I had met at a jamboree, so I went to see him. He said, where are you going to sleep at night? I said, in bed. He said, very funny. Where are you going to get your next meal? I said, I don't know where I'll get it, but I know where I'll put it. I wasn't feeling quite as cheerful as that. It was like whistling in the dark, you know, keeping up a brave front, as it were. There I was in a strange country, England. I'd never been in England except once for a short vacation. But he said, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to do evangelism. He said, what's an evangelist? You see, in the Roman Catholic Church, there are only four evangelists. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They talk of Matthew the Evangelist and Mark the Evangelist and so on. Well, I see an evangelist is one who travels with the God. But he said in the Catholic Church, when a man has a vocation for the priesthood, we send him to a theological college. I thought Protestants did the same. I said, so they do. And he said, why are you doing it differently? I said, I, I feel called. He offered to lend me enough money to go home on the next ship to Ireland. But I said, Frank, I don't want to borrow your money. I said, the scripture says, my God shall supply all your need. If that's true, I can depend upon it. But if it's not true, the sooner I find that, the better. So I started on my bicycle on a journey that was to take me all around the world. When I reached Chester, an old English city with a wall around it, it began to rain heavily, so I prayed that it might reach Shrewsbury, about 40 miles south, without getting wet. Now, you'd agree that you couldn't cycle 40 miles in the rain and not get wet. I was very thin in those days, but even so, I couldn't do that. But I got to Shrewsbury without getting wet, and yet it rained all the way. Now, most American kids say, did you hitchhike? Hitchhiking was unknown over there. It wasn't until the GIs went over during the war and showed the Limeys how to do it that they knew what hitchhiking was. In 1933, if you'd stood in a road in England with your thumb out like that, they would have thought you had a sore thumb. <laughs> so I didn't hitchhike, but this lorry driver, truck driver, they call them lorries over there, this truck driver shouted, hello there, in such a friendly way, I knew he must have made a mistake. English people don't speak to strangers. I used to think they were snooty, but they're not. They're reserved. They're shy. They just don't speak to strangers. So I wheeled my bicycle over. I said, did you mistake me for someone? 
Oh, I say, he said, I, I thought you were a friend of mine called Bert Cook. I said, that's funny, I have a friend called Bert Cook too. He said, but you're not English. I said, no, I'm from Ireland. He said, I knew you were a foreigner as soon as you opened your mouth. <laughs> then he said, you wouldn't know the Bert Cook that I know, because he was English. I said, I was in England once before, just for a short holiday. And I said, I met this Bert Cook, Herbert J. Cook was his name, in Northampton. He was studying for the Methodist ministry. He looked at me in amazement. He said, blimey, mate, it's the same bloke. <laughs> he said, where are you headed for? I said, London. He said, not tonight. I said, no, it'll take me three days on a bicycle. How'd you like to ride with me? I said, you going to London? No, no, he said, I'm going down the other way to Cardiff, but he said, I could take you as far as Wellington. So I said, where's Wellington? He said, that's near Shrewsbury. I was praying that I might get to Shrewsbury without getting wet. I still remember to sip it yesterday. The narrow winding roads, they do have motorways now, but they didn't then. Narrow winding roads, and he was driving this big truck around the bends. And I was witnessing to him about Christ. Finally, he said, well, Mr. Orr, they're a little more formal over there. They give you your title, you know. Well, Mr. Orr, he said, if I were to be converted right now, he said, uh, how do I go about it? Well, I said, you pray, and I explain the way of salvation drove around another bend. He said, if I pray right now, am I supposed to close my eyes? I said, keep your eyes open and the Lord will understand. <laughs> he got converted with his eyes open. I arrived in Shrewsbury. It was 11 o'clock at night. I had nowhere to stay. However, the Salvation Army over there at those days had working men's hostels where you could get a bed for a dime. Something like sixpence it was. I thought that'd be something in my line. I'd much less than 65 cents now. So I stopped a policeman. You can picture an English Bobby. I stopped him and I said, could you tell me where I could get cheap accommodation for the night? He looked me up and down. He said, what do you do for a living? Now I knew exactly what was in his mind. During the Depression they arrested people out of work as vagrants because they were tempted to steal and so forth. And they'd make them work in some kind of work house or something like that and then let them go again. What do you do for a living? Now what could I say? I couldn't say I was a clergyman. I'd not been ordained. I'd been a bookkeeper, but I wasn't a traveling bookkeeper. So I said, I'm, I'm an evangelist. He said, you don't look like an evangelist to me. Well, I said, what's an evangelist supposed to look like? Well, now, of course, everyone tries to look like Billy Graham, but in those days we didn't have a pattern. So um, I said, what, what's an evangelist supposed to Well, he said, you're very young. I said, I'm 21. Well, he said, that's young for an evangelist. How long have you been an evangelist? Well, I said, just a little while. He said, well, how long have you been an evangelist? I said, not very long. He said, I have reasons for asking. How long have you been an evangelist? Well, I said, sir, if you must be technical, I started at 8 o'clock this morning. <laughs> he said, do you have anything to show that you're genuine? Now, I had six letters of introduction with me. When my friends heard I was going away, although they thought I was crazy, they thought, well, we'll do anything we can to help. I had a letter written by a Presbyterian minister, a Baptist minister, a Methodist minister. The last one of the six was written by an obscure friend of mine who worked in what we would call a storefront mission. He wasn't well known. I didn't ask him for a letter. He volunteered it. I was going to leave it behind then. I thought, if he was nice enough to write a letter, I might as well take it with me. It was the nicest and most enthusiastic letter of all. I thought this policeman in the middle of England wouldn't know anyone in Ireland anyway. So I showed him the letter written by my obscure friend. He read it through and then he shook hands warmly. He was a converted policeman. He was a deacon in the Shrewsbury Baptist Church. And he was a close friend of the William Philip that wrote that letter in Ireland. He took me home. That night I slept in a feather bed. 
Next morning, I had two eggs for breakfast. Frank Nelson, my Roman Catholic friend, said, Where are you going to sleep at night? Where are you going to get your next meal? That was my first night. Something clicked. If God can take care of me one day, he can take care of me tomorrow. If the Lord takes care of me this week, he can take care of me next week. This month, next month. You see, when the disciples went to the Lord and said, Lord, increase our faith, he didn't say, very well then, I'll give you a great, big, ready-made faith. You can put it up in a shelf and admire it, and any time you need some, reach for it. No, no. He looked for the smallest thing he could find. A grain of mustard seed. And he said, if your faith this size, you can move mountains. I learned that lesson. In other words, you use the little faith that you have. And God's way of measuring isn't like ours. You've got only a pint of faith, use it and you find you've got a gallon. You've only got a gallon of faith, use it and you find you've got a tank full. That's the way it works. And so I, oh, I roughed it. I slept under haystacks sometimes. I was telling the pastor that when I came to Texas first, I slept all night in the car in Lubbock. But uh, at least I had a car in those days in, in England, I had only a bicycle. But you can put a bicycle under a haystack too. I was cycling in Kent near London when my old bicycle broke down. I had discovered I needed new handlebars, a new front fork, new back wheel, new front wheel, new three-speed gear, new crank, new pedals, new tires, new tubes, and several other new parts. <laughs> so I decided to pray for a new bicycle, or the money to buy one. I had to wheel that bicycle ten miles. Have you ever wheeled a bicycle for ten miles? You, you get all twisted to one side and then you walk on the other side. I was asked to spend the Christmas vacation with an Englishman at a place called Gravesend. The time I got there, walking, wheeling, I was late for supper. They'd gone out to a meeting, but they left the back door unlatched. When I let myself in, there was a note on the table, make yourself at home, and there was some food under a nice little cloth. Now, I was praying for a new bicycle, and the answer to prayer came so unexpectedly. A Baptist church, a Baptist pastor on the other side of the River Thames in Essex had suddenly taken ill. His deacons were in desperation trying to get another preacher to take his place two days before Christmas. Most people have made their arrangements for Christmas in advance. They called this one, that one. They said, sorry, we have other arrangements. I don't know how they got my name. I certainly don't know how they got my address, but they called me long distance and asked me if I'd come and preach the Christmas sermons in that church. I told the deacon on the phone, but you don't know anything about me. He said, Mr. Orr, don't be offended, but we're so hard up, we can take anybody. <laughs> I preached in that church. Nobody knew that I needed a new bicycle, but another man came up to me after the meeting. To make a long story short, he wanted to know if I would be offended if he offered me a Christmas present. A bicycle that he had custom built in Coventry, the best bicycle built in the world at that time. It was handball bearinged. Beautiful machine. Of course I I said, what makes you offer it to me? I had no intention of refusing it. I just it's unusual, you know. I wonder how many times Pastor McDonald has been offered a bicycle after a meeting. So I said, what makes you offer it to me? But he, he, he flushed, he was embarrassed. English people are much more sensitive, you know. There is a difference in national temperament. An Englishman's always afraid of making a fool of himself, so he's very careful what he says. An Irishman doesn't care whether he makes a fool of himself or not, so he doesn't care what he says. An American, an American doesn't realize when he's making a fool of himself.
So he got red in the face and he explained that his father had died and left him some money and he bought a car. Couldn't be bothered with a bicycle anymore, although it was the best bicycle in the country. Hung it up in the shed. But he said, if, if, if you'll accept it, I'd be glad to give it to you. And he put on new tires. I really enjoyed riding that bicycle. It was a super centaur. I remember once, you may find this hard to believe, that in, in, it was in Hertfordshire. I had come down a hill and I'd worked up speed and I passed a car. And the man speeded up and shouted to me, you were doing 35. <laughs> well, I don't want to take all evening telling you, that was just my first few weeks of adventures. Now, in the first year or so, when I wrote that book, Cam God, I did not have campaigns. I went around as a witness, urging people to pray. The days were getting darker. Hitler had arisen, and things were getting worse. But I was invited to take up a big position after I'd been preaching for a while, and I turned it down. I went to Norway, arrived in Oslo with 11 kroner. Let's see, what would that be today? It's about two dollars? Something like that. And there I saw a revival for the first time. I had remembered something when I was a boy of nine, the movement of God under W.P. Nicholson. I was too young to take it in. Although it was a movement of the Spirit of God. But in Norway, it was tremendous stirring. I didn't know anyone there, but the door opened very quickly, and I stayed in the Baptist seminary and went with the students, one church after another. All the churches were full. Great meetings in the Calmers Garden, Assembly Hall, and I preached in Bethlehem, and Albert Lumbers for Seminary, and all these places. That was the first time I'd really seen revival that affected the whole country. And that's what drew Armand Gesswein and me together. We both had a kind of uh, baptism of fire there in that sense. And by the way, we both married Norwegian girls. Except uh, he got his from the north of Norway and I got mine from the south of South Africa. <laughs> I got 24 carat gold. Amen. <laughs> Well, we saw revival in Norway and the same sort of thing in Scandinavia. In those days, it was a movement, definitely a movement. It should be written up. Trouble is, people don't write these things. They're more often writing biographies of individuals than they write of movements of the Spirit of God. Then in Riga, whom should I meet but Jimmy Stewart, James Stewart, the Scottish footballer? And there was a movement of revival in Latvia. The Lord had anointed James Stewart, and when he went to Hungary, there was such a movement that traffic was disrupted. That's another story out of it. Ruth, his wife, his widow, has told it about it in a couple of chapters, but somebody needs to write that up. Someone, when I wrote my first book, said it's easy for things like that to happen in a Christian country like England, where people are kind-hearted. I thought, well, if I were to go to Russia, where it's not a Christian country, that would shut them up. So I traveled all the way to Moscow and Leningrad and back again, but I was in Copenhagen in Denmark. I arrived there with just one dollar, five Danish kroner, five crowns. I didn't know anyone in the whole of Denmark, but someone had told me there was a fine Lutheran layman, a businessman, who knew all the Lutheran churches and the free churches. Get in touch with him. If he takes a liking to you, he'll arrange meetings for you. I looked him up in the phone book. His name was Sorensen. And to my dismay, I discovered that Sorensen was a commonest Danish name. Just like Smith in English-speaking countries. I used to wonder, by the way, where all the Smiths came from, but I found out 
in Toronto. I was preaching for Oswald Smith and I discovered where all the Smiths came from. Down near the Union Depot on Front Street there was a big sign that said the Smith Manufacturing Company. <laughs> There must have been a Surison Manufacturing Company in Copenhagen because of four columns to a page. Now, could you imagine someone from, say, Bolivia arriving in Dallas and, and speaking to a policeman saying, I'm looking for a man called Smith. What would the policeman say? He'd say, well, what initials? Well, I don't know the initials. Well, the policeman would say, I give up. I mean, you look in the telephone directory at all the Smiths. So I found pages of Sorensons. And I thought, now, can't I remember anything else about it? Oh, it came back to me. You know the way when you think a little bit it comes back? His name was Nils, N-I-L-S. So I went back to the phone book. There were only five Neil Sorensons. I thought, well, I can... I'm not going to phone at only a dollar. If you've only a dollar, you're not going to waste a nickel on the phone. So I thought, well, now this is the first of all day. I <laughs> have nothing to do. I had nowhere to go and eat, just a dollar on me. But I walked to the first address, two Kleins Gata, two Little Street. It was an apartment block. Went upstairs, found the name Sorensen, rang the bell. Lady came to the door. I began in my very best Danish. Uh, versus Neela, her Sorensen, her. If you please, is Mr. Sorensen here? She replied in Danish, but her Danish was quite different to my Danish. Now, don't be too severe on me. I'd only been there two or three hours, and I didn't speak the language very fluently. So I asked her the second time. I made a little variation. I said, is Mr. Sorensen at home? She just repeated the same thing over again. Uh, I was going to ask her the third time, would she close the door on me? Now, you know, it's useless to argue with a lady. She always gets the last word, but if you don't understand the last word, it's humiliating. I didn't know what she was saying. She may have been saying, I've told you already, and just closed the door. I went down the stairs, and suddenly she opened the door and called me back. She went into the house and came out again with a red-covered book in her hand. It was my first book, published in England, only three weeks before, published in English, which she couldn't understand. She said, photograph, D, D. I replied in faultless Danish, ya, 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 ya. <laughs> she talked to me in Danish, I couldn't understand her. I talked in English and she couldn't understand me. So she telephoned her husband. He spoke business English. He said, Mr. Or, this sounds incredible. I said, what does? He said, Miss Anna Christensen, one of our Danish lady missionaries in the China Inland Mission, sent me your book just last week and told us to pray that you would come to Denmark. He said, I read your book. I enjoyed it. I, I, I thought it would be wonderful if you come and stir up our young people. He said, I prayed that you would come, but I did not expect you would come so quickly. And now you telephone me from my own house. Let me talk to my wife again. So I called her over and she talked in Danish. She laughed a lot. I didn't know what she was laughing about, but then she gave me the phone. He said, uh, my wife <laughs> has asked you if you will stay for supper, but he said, you don't seem to understand. Uh, stay for lunch it was. So I stayed for lunch and then came back for supper. I was hoping they'd put me up for the night as well, but they were a married couple without children. They had a utility apartment right downtown, and so they didn't ask me to stay. However, they took me along to a meeting in the Technical Institute ballroom, and I preached to 500 people. Remembered as if it were yesterday. Ten after ten, the meeting was over. I stepped outside. It was bitterly cold. It was below zero. A surgeon said, well, brother, that was splendid. Now, I want you to do me a favor. I said, what is that? He said, I want you to change your hotel. I said, what for? I should have said, what with? <laughs> Well, he said, down by the city hall, there's an excellent Christian hotel run by Christian management, and they give special discounts to preachers. So he said, I will go with you to the hotel where you're staying to apologize for you. I said, you better wait here. I'll get my own baggage. I'd left my suitcase in a little candy store. Well, he said, you weren't long. I said, no. No trouble. I said, no. You mean they weren't disappointed you did not sleep there for the night? I said, apparently not. He said, let me carry your bag. 
He said, of course, you understand, while you're in Denmark, you'll be my guest. That was good news because I didn't have the money to pay for the hotel. He introduced me to the booking clerk and he said, now, good night, Mr. Orr. I come for you tomorrow morning, 10 o'clock. I must open my mail at the office first. The clerk, in the meantime, went down the list of rooms and he said, I'm sorry, Mr. Orr. We don't have a single room in the house. I was back to square one. Oh, he said, don't misunderstand. We have double rooms. We have family apartments. We have suites of rooms, but the, the, they're more expensive. Uh, he said, um, but Sir and such a good friend of ours, we'd be glad to let you have the more expensive room for the cheaper price. Come upstairs. I followed him along the corridor. He opened the door, switched on the light. There was a big family apartment. Now, I'd been praying for a bed. But there was a grand piano and a reading desk, and a writing lamp, a, a writing desk, a reading lamp, and a, a sofa, and four chairs, and four beds. He said to me, you can sleep in them, turn about if you like, we charge same price. He thought that was a joke, but I didn't. I slept in all four beds that night. <laughs> That's the way it went all the way into Soviet Russia. But, um, I could take a week of meetings to tell you about adventures in other countries. That all happened during the Depression. And I found those little books of mine were a great encouragement to people who were really hard up and wondering if God did answer prayer. Yes, he answers prayer. I crossed over to Canada and uh, Oswald Smith asked me to preach there that great people's church. And that was a church in which there was a perennial movement, a movement going on year by year. He was the man of the great missionary bird. And by the way, he's still alive, he's 93, still takes part in the services. I came as associate pastor afterwards and got to know him quite well. But in those days, we had such a movement in that people's church, it's the largest church in Canada, I believe, we had to move to the Massey Hall Auditorium. And then from there, I went into the States and preached in places like Moody Church and Church of the Open Door and so forth. But as far as real revival was concerned, I remember speaking in the Wheaton College Chapel on the 13th of January 1936. And uh, about a thousand students in those days. A student there sent up a note. You have spoken on a revival. When do you think you'll see revival? Or rather, he came up to see me afterwards. And I said, well, what are you doing about it? Because you were having half nights of prayer. Well, I said, that's the case. And I said, whenever you begin to put things right with the Lord, you can expect something to happen. So the students redoubled their prayers for revival at Wheaton. They were looking forward to the coming of Robert McQuilkin of Columbia Bible College in South Carolina. They felt sure the Lord would break through and revival then. But alas, when Dr. McQuilkin came through, that godly man, he developed laryngitis. couldn't speak a word. It was their annual campaign, and Homer Hammontree was the song leader, and they had to pinch hit by asking somebody to come over from Moody and from Northern Baptist Assembly to take the meetings. What a disintegrated series it was. The students' hopes plummeted. But one Thursday, I believe, it was Walter Wilson, a medical doctor, belonged to the Brethren, but who had a message on the Holy Spirit, spoken chapel. But he had to catch a train. He had interrupted his schedule and he had to catch a train to St. Louis so he took off before the benediction and a student passed up a note saying uh, we heard about revival again when are we going to see revival at Wheaton and Hammond Tree answered in a very perfunctory way well I suppose we pay the price so the student stood up and said I'm the student that wrote that note some folks think I'm a big man on campus but things are not right in my life and start confessing his faults by the way that was Don Hillis He's now Associate General Director of Evangelical Alliance Mission. Brother Dick his twin brother. And someone shouted, let's all pray. They got to their knees. And that was one of those phenomenal meetings. It went on 38 hours, I believe, at that time. There were some humorous aspects. Wheaton had a strict rule against smoking. There were some students who couldn't break the habit, didn't choose to. They discovered what you might call a fail-safe method of having their smoke 
and getting away with it, they, during chapel, chapel was compulsory, they went in, they went down a steep staircase to the furnace room, where they could smoke, threw the butts into the furnace, no evidence. They had to come up another staircase right in front of the platform. So they had to wait until everyone was moving out. Then the monitors counted their attendance going out. This time they'd had their cigarettes. They had timed it fairly carefully. They were waiting for the shuffle of feet for the singing the last hymn. Ten o'clock, quarter past ten, ten thirty. Who's preaching to that? Eleven fifteen. When the clock struck twelve, one fellow turned pale and he said, It's the rapture and we're left behind. <laughs> Well, I was in Nacogdoches in Texas at the time. I got a telegram from President Buswell saying, Glorious revival, quite independent human instruments have broken out of Freedom. I changed my schedule and went up by train and no flights in those days and got into the tail end to see what it was really like. I began to see that we may have revival. Not necessarily waiting for a movement throughout the country. Because they had a real, by the way, out of that revival came some remarkable missionaries. Let me see if my memory serves me right. One from the Congo, Wil Wilbert Norton. And uh, another one went to Costa Rica. I could tell it several. Among those who were affected, who didn't go to the mission field, were people like Carl Henry and Harold Wenzel, Stacy Woods, and so forth. Well, Dr. McQuilkin went back to Columbia, South Carolina, and told his students in Columbia Bible College, which is a missionary college, they were all converted there, about the revival. They started praying. Oswald Smith was to come down for an Easter campaign. I was preaching for a young Presbyterian minister in Atlanta. His name was Peter Marshall. You heard that name, I suppose? He wasn't well known in those days. Strange how many people I met became famous afterwards. <laughs> but uh, I went over from there to Columbia and well, the Lord poured out revival right away. I, we couldn't report extraordinary conversions in the college because they were all converted and dedicated to the mission field. But a nurse came back from the hospital and said, I've led 27 people to Christ this week. Oh, the meeting was powerful. So I began to see that sort of thing. That encouraged me. So when I went down to New Zealand, that was the next place, we saw a real revival in the community. A place called Narawakia. During the heat of that revival, I went to the post office. On the back of an envelope, I wrote that hymn, Search Me, O God, and Know My Heart Today. J. Oswald Saunders has written an account of that moment. We were as men that dreamed. So it began taking on a different complexion. We went over to Australia and we saw movements of revival out of the great movement in Melbourne. They ended up in the big circus stadium there. Came the campaigners for Christ. You've heard of that organization that happened. Most of the young men revived, became leaders of that movement. Then in South Africa, a movement about 6,000 professed conversion. So that takes us up to the end of the war, up to the beginning of the war, I should say. I went back, back to study. At, I became associate pastor with Oswald Smith, and then I went to Northern Baptist Center to study. I'm glad I did. You know, when I went to Oxford to study revival, I got an anonymous letter from some Christian saying, Having begun in the spirit, are you now made perfect in the flesh? I never regretted going. It's like trying to be a workman without tools. You could want to be the best carpenter in the world, but you have to learn your trade. And I find that, for instance, in my field particularly, where I have to convince people about, for instance, Armand said last night, um, in the 1930s, everybody was a brother in this country was con convinced that these were the days of the apostles and God couldn't work. It wasn't until Billy Graham had his breakthrough in Los Angeles that he even believed that mass evangelism was possible again. But uh, the time in the Air Force, we couldn't call it revival, but we saw a movement of the Holy Spirit. Jefferson Barracks. still remember. This may sound very odd. So many men had bad colds. I was amused by it. I got reprimanded from the station hospital. Our meetings were 
still baking so fast she couldn't have any chapel holding and we were out there and met a very treacherous climate in the St. Louis area and the men all caught cold thousands of them out in the open air arena of course whenever they have reprimanded us officially for this uh, it meant to, we had to rearrange our meetings but it was a movement of the Holy Spirit the same thing overseas a place like Moritai but uh, 1949 in fact 48 I was back in this country and it was in 49 in spring about March the 1st that we had Pacific Palisades meeting Armands were That was a touch of the mind. Hundreds of pastors. You know, there's some people, you know, who simplify history and they think Billy Graham came to Los Angeles and the result of this very faithful preaching a revival broke out. No, the revival movement was underway. And Billy himself was revived up here at Forest Home. But he's been called to evangelism. I mean, when Sherwood worked, where is Judy? When he said that uh, it wasn't until he went to Canada he saw what revival really meant. Billy is an anointed evangelist. Sometimes his evangelistic campaigns are undergirded by revival. Other times they're not. He can't manufacture the situation. But you notice when Billy says this is the nearest to revival we've ever seen, type of thing. He means that's when the Holy Spirit was working the most among his people. But uh, because people say, well, is revival possible nowadays? Uh, 1951, I went down to Brazil. I came back, told my wife, let's all go to Brazil, the whole family. She said, what about school for the children? I said, we'll find something. But I said, 81 churches in Sao Paulo have started weekly prayer meetings for revival. And there's going to be a movement. And we saw a movement throughout Brazil. Now, it wouldn't be fitting for me to, shall I say, give you a rundown of my experiences there, but I'm going to just quote from this is a dissertation recently written by Charles Gates of the Nazarene Mission. The title is The Brazilian Revival of 1952, Its Antecedents and Effects. British, I should say, the British, American, and Brazilian Bible Societies reported 1952, a year of triumph. Never before so many scriptures put in the hands of the people. The American Bible Society said in many ways 1952 was a triumphant year. The Brazilian Bible Society said while most of the growth of the evangelical movement could be attributed to day by day witness of its members, special efforts also drew the attention of the people. In a nationwide evangelistic crusade crossing denominational lines, drawing the interest of the multitudes, a special evangelistic team went from center to center calling for repentance and dedication to Christ. Time and time again, the large auditoriums couldn't seat the thousands who came to hear the gospel. Hundreds upon hundreds came forward accepting Christ. A British missionary, the British and Foreign Bible Society, said there were some who compared this movement to the great nationwide revivals that laid the foundation of Protestant growth in the United States. The strong feeling in 1952 was a crucial hour of victory in winning Brazil to Christ. Well, you find this from all the observers. And uh, my friend was interested to find out what really happened as a result you find that the Presbyterians took in more converts in 1952 than any year for about 45 years. Probably it was three times the average. You find a similar movement among the Baptists. Among the Assembly of God it was just guesswork. They couldn't keep up with it. They had 130,000 members in 1951. In 1955 when they first made a count, 307,000 signed. That was the way things were going. And I would say Brazil was the happiest year of my life. My colleague Bill Dunlap was with me in Bauru, where Bill was on his own for the first time. The church has increased more in one month than the previous 20 years. One church had more in the Sunday, in the early morning prayer meetings each day than the whole Protestant population of the time before their revival. So we've seen touches of revival. In India, Coimbatore, 
Art, the Bishop of Coimbatore, Apasami, has written about. I believe in revival. But you see, when people ask me about today, I can't say we're in the midst of that kind of revival throughout the United States. I rejoice in the loosening up there's been. This was, remark was made in London, not in this country, but um, the former pres principal of the London Bible College was speaking on the house churches in Britain. There are about 200,000 house churches over there. And he said, well, you know, there are some who are critical of this renewal movement. But he said, it has changed the attitude to worship. He said, I well remember the old days when people would say, let's cut through the preliminaries and get to the speaker. He said, isn't that a wonderful idea of worship of God? Whereas today, people are more concerned. That's one good thing. But my great fear has been among the manipulators. Those who take advantage of movements in spirit. For instance, I believe there's a gift of prophecy. There's such a thing. It's supplementary. This is the main thing. But sometimes God speaks to his people. But have you ever met the manipulators who want to get their way? I get up and saying something. One of the favorite expressions to begin, Behold, I, the Lord, thy God, am speaking in the midst of thee. As a friend of mine said, he was in a meeting where somebody thought he needed straightening out. And the man said, And behold, my servant Patrick has done wonderful things for which he will receive his reward. But he has yet many things to learn if he will only learn to listen. So I said, Pat, were you impressed? He said, not a bit. He said, my name is not Patrick. Pat's my nickname. And he said, here was a man claiming to be the Holy Spirit and calling me Patrick. That's what I call manipulation. Almost everything the Lord can do, the devil will seek to counterfeit. And you find people who get into and what makes me shudder is that those who want to make money for it, they'll do anything for it. That's what scares me. And uh, on the other hand, to be very fair, I was speaking at the central seminary of a denomination that has denounced the charismatic movement every year. The faculty asked me, what advice do you have? for us. Now I'm a Baptist minister and uh, I always held the view there's nothing wrong with us Baptists that a revival couldn't cure. <laughs> but they knew that I was speaking from a non-charismatic point of view. But I said, do you think the charismatic movement was pulled up and dissolved next week? Yes, we never said that. Let's how about next year? Well, not next year, either, no. Well, I said, would you concede there may be around when the Lord comes? <laughs> yes. Like, now, let me ask a fair question. Do you think there are any deficiencies in the charismatic movement? They said, we think the biggest deficiency is there isn't enough stress in holy living. I said, I feel the same way. Now, the last word, when people say, what do you think is most missing today? I'm going to put my finger on it. The first word in the mouth of John the Baptist, the Lord Jesus, the twelve disciples, the seventy disciples, the first word in the last message of the Lord Jesus to his disciples, the first word of exhortation by the Apostle Paul at Pentecost, and by the Apostle Peter at Pentecost, and the Apostle Paul throughout his ministry, is the word repent. It is the first word of the gospel. It is the point of the sword of the Lord. Most Christians don't know this. When I say, what's the first word of the gospel? Some shout, John 3.16, love. Or somebody will say, only believe. That's why. But the first word is repent. And the Lord Jesus said, repent and believe. You say, is that two things? No, no, one thing. If I said, leave Los Angeles, go to London, is that one commandment or two? Sounds like two, but there's only one. You couldn't go to London without leaving this house. And you cannot truly believe without changing your attitude, which is the meaning of the word of head. There's a problem. Most people don't know what the word means. Metanoia means change of thinking. 
And so that we go around telling people just to invite Jesus into their hearts. I remember in the Hollywood Christian group, Billy Graham was a speaker and I was a chairman. Half a dozen came through that night, but one who raised his hand was Mickey Corn, public enemy number one, the gangster. But he went back on it. He had heard that Roy Rogers was a converted cowboy and a Christian cowboy and Colleen Santan's and a Christian actress, Tim Spencer, Christian songwriter, Don Moomaw, Christian footballer, Frank Carlson, a Christian senator, and Mickey thought he could be a Christian gangster. He really did. He told my friend who talked to him, you didn't tell me how to give up my career. He meant his rackets. You didn't tell me how to give up my friends. He thought he could invite Jesus into his rackets. Help him be a better gangster. Yes, there's a lot of young people in our churches who think they can be Christian fornicators. And in London, Kenneth Anderson said to me, Edwin, have you ever met a Christian con man? Have you ever met the Christian who says, well, all right, I did do it, but you can't sue me. You're a Christian. Jack Hayford said to me, there's another side to that question. In Romans it says, to believers, a magistrate is the ordained servant of God to punish evil to him. If you always do right, you don't need to fear the magistrate. But if you, that believers, don't do right, you've every reason to fear him. It's a shame when the church won't settle these things. It has to go to the law. But there's your problem. You remember when Larry Flint was born again? The Fuller students were intrigued, to say the least. Somebody got a copy of the first editorial, and I read it there. I don't subscribe to the hustler, so I had to look at the Xerox copy of the editorial. Born again? Yes, I'm born again. And I follow the spirit of Buddha, Muhammad, and Jesus. Poor fellow still doesn't know the score. But you see, he was inviting Jesus to come into the hustler. Maybe the Lord wanted to take him right out of it. And that's our weakness in evangelism today. Take the three evangelistic parables. The lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son. Out of the end, rejoice with me for I found the sheep that I lost. That's the end of the story. But then the Lord Jesus said, there's more joy over one sinner who repents. Why did he add that? If he hadn't added that, someone would have said the sheep never repented. Store the lost coin. Rejoice me, I find the coin I lost. That's the end of the story. But the Lord said, there's more joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Why did he say that? Because otherwise, some theologian would have said a coin is incapable of repenting, therefore it's not required. But in the story of the lost son, he didn't add a word. Because it was in the story. And I find that that's one of the great things today. Uh, when someone said last night that Glenn Shepherd stressed repentance, my heart gave a little leap there because that's what I've been preaching when the doors opened in the Southern Baptist Convention. I tell my Baptist friends I'm an evangelical of evangelicals. I believe in conversion, but repent and be converted. And I believe in believers' baptism, but it says repent and be baptized. We have all sorts of substitute things. Come forward and be baptized. Oh no. I think this is the missing note. And if there's a genuine move to the Spirit of God, it won't only be seeking after the gifts. It will mean a deep conviction of sin and transformation of life on the part, first of all, of God's people, but most of all on the part of the masses. So, uh, one of my friends said, well, you know, I use Revelation 3.20 a lot to invite Jesus into your heart. But honestly, Edwin, he said, I hope they'll, they'll, they'll change. Now, I'm disappointed if they don't. Why don't you tell them? You go anywhere in the States today, you'll find ramps for handicapped people and so forth because of birth defects. George Gallup told me last year that the number of born-again people in the United States has gone up 46% to 53%. I quoted that in the Rose Bowl to 50,000 people. And they started to applaud. 
And I stopped them. I said, I don't believe a word of it. I had lived in the same house for 33 years in Los Angeles. That's a record for California. But you couldn't kid me that more than half the people in that street are born again. We've got a, a, a weak in gospel. People have got to know what sin is and why it is sin. To bring about conviction of sin. So when I have a chance of doing it, I try to inject that thought. We've got to get back to essentials. It's a primary doctrine. By the way, just something flashed into my mind. At the Oxford Conference, a friend of mine who's a bookworm gave us a paper. Never heard anything like it before. He spoke about Hebrews who spoke of repentance from dead works. He says, isn't that a strange phrase? We think of repentance from sin. But it says from dead works. Now, what are dead works? Well, he said, immediately we think of our Roman Catholic friends going barefoot in a pilgrimage with their feet bleeding as they climb the mountain, St. Patrick's Mountain in Ireland, all this sort of thing. That's dead works. But aren't we evangelicals guilty of the same thing? In some ways, hasn't the invitation become a dead work in some places? Where they try to get them forward by hook or by crook, just to get them to move forward. The result is we're taking in lots of people who don't know the first thing about repentance. Repentance from dead works means that we get to the place where unless the Lord is in it, we shouldn't stoop to it. We shouldn't try to duplicate it. I've been helped so much when I found that men like Evan Roberts, and someone was mentioned last night, uh, it's Frank Marcus, wouldn't speak unless he was anointed. What a boon to the church that would be when we would be delivered from the obligation of speaking when we don't have a message. Well, what did you ask me, Arm, to give me a, give you a chunk of my heart? <laughs> Thank you for watching this video. Feel free to like this video and subscribe to this channel, to stay up to date, with new videos as they come online.